Colonial Williamsburg, fences were a requirement. Homeowners had to install fences within six months of the occupancy of their property. Now, material for fences and installation could be expensive as it is today, but it was a necessity if you wanted to keep your cow from straying into someone else's garden. Now, this is one of the best examples of a flat picket fence, and it has a nice diamond cut at the top of the pickets. Here's one of my favorite fences. It's a good example of a flat picket fence that would often define the property lines. And what I like about it are the proportions. Nice, thin slats, spaced. But also, what's attractive is this decorative top, which is reflected in the post. Formed in concrete here for maintenance reasons, but in the early 18th century, formed from wood. A really nice detail that I think we can make. Here's another good example of a flat picket fence. This one is about four and a half feet tall, and the top of the pickets are cut in the shape of a flame. An original fence like this was found in Robinson, South Carolina in the early 1700s. Here's a fence that I've seen nowhere else except here at Williamsburg. It's a paled fence that encloses the kitchen garden behind the governor's palace. It was really meant to keep the animals out of the garden. It's made up of random width boards set fairly close to one another. And up at the top, the valleys and peaks pay no attention to the individual boards themselves. Let's take a look at the details inside. The fence travels up a long slope, which is a real headache for a fence installer. Here, what they've done is kept the post vertical. The stringers follow the slope and the pails are perfectly plumb, as they should be. Hard by the governor's palace is another good example of a flat picket fence. This time, the top of the pickets are just slightly rounded. I wanted to show you this gate closure. You see there's a chain attached to the gate down to a weighted ball and back up to a post. As I come through the gate, the chain will be stretched out, and as I pass through, the weight does the rest. Perhaps the most rustic of the picket fences is this one. The stringers are actually slabs, not milled pieces of wood. And the pickets have actually been sharpened at the top, probably done with an ax. And they appear to be hand split. What do you think? It's a look. Here's a good example of a highly crafted fence. Let's look at how it's made. They use square pickets set at a 45 degree angle, and they actually pass through mortises cut right through the stringers, both the top one and the bottom one. They also took the time to slope the tops of the stringers so the water would shed. I can't really imagine what it would have been like to cut dozens of mortises with hand tools. We'll have it a lot easier back at the shop with our machinery. After talking to some of the most respected fence manufacturers in the country, they confirmed our choice, which is Eastern White Cedar. Very resistant to decay and nice to work with. Now, I want to get started today building this fence section, which has through mortises in the stringers for the square pails. I'd also like to take a moment to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Now I've taken some material and laid out the stringers for our fence section. Four inches on center for the pails. And the first thing I want to do is drill a one inch hole all the way through at each location. So I've set up my drill press with a Forstner bit a little clamp as a straight edge, and I put a piece of scrap plywood underneath so that as the bit goes through the stringer, it won't break out.
Now the drill press does a nice job removing most of the material for each mortise. I'm going to have to finish them up using my newest tool here at the workshop, which is a hollow chisel mortiser. It's a single function tool. It does only mortises. And I've set it up with a half inch bit and a half inch mortising chisel. It has a fence, which can be set in and out for various mortise locations, and a hole down to keep the piece from lifting up as I lift the bit out of the wood. I've also put a piece of masking tape on the fence with a little indicator mark, which I'll align with the layout for the pail. Now, first thing I'm going to do is do this back corner. Now, that represents one corner of the square. And I'll do the whole length of the stringer. Now I'm just going to flip the stringer end for end and get the opposing point. There are a lot of different ways to join fence sections to the post. One of the strongest and nicest is a mortise and tenon joint. Here's the tenon on the end of the stringer. And of course, a corresponding mortise would be in the post. Now's the time to cut the tenons on the stringers. And I'm using my radial arm saw, which is set up with a stacked dado head cutter. One of the things that I really liked about this fence style was that the tops of the stringers had been beveled to allow the water to run off. So I've set up my table saw, tilting the blade to 10 degrees and setting the rip fence. Two passes on each stringer will do it. To smooth up the marks left by the saw blade, I'm going to turn to my joiner. And just as with the saw, I've tilted the fence to 10 degrees. Now my miter box does a good job making the pointed tops on the pails, especially since I have this stop device which holds it in the same position. Well, now I'm ready to put one of the fence sections together. And what I've done is put a long straight 2x4 on top of my workbench. Then I've placed a few spacers between the bottom of the stringer and the 2x4, and what that does is allows the right amount of pail to drop below the rail. And I've clamped it all in place. And I'm just going to slip these in all the way down the line, and then I'm going to put the top stringer on. Well, now's when you could use the help of your 12 closest friends, but Barring that, I guess, just carefully work along and slip them in from one end to the other. And if you take your time, you'll have some success. Okay, now with the diagonals equal, I know that the section of fence is square. And I'll pin it all together with some eight-penny galvanized finish nails. 
one at each pail. Well, that's all there is to making that style of fence. Let's turn our attention to a couple other variations. One of them is this style of paled fence, a little bit taller, and the top of the pail is cut in the shape of a flame. Now, I'm certain that the original was cut all by hand, one at a time. Now, I could use a bandsaw or even a handheld jigsaw, but in order to speed up production, I think I've come up with another technique. What I did is made a template the exact copy of the flame out of a piece of 3 8 inch plywood. I'm going to clamp that in place at my workbench. Then there are two pine strips into which I'll slip a blank pail and just bring it even with the template. And down on this back end, I'm just going to clamp it so it won't move around. Now to cut the shape of the flame, I'm just going to use my router, which is set up with what's known as a flush laminate trimming bit has a couple cutting edges and a ball bearing. The ball bearing just follows the outline of the template and the cutter does all the work. Does a great job. a couple little burrs on the edges which I can knock off with a piece of sandpaper and what I'm gonna have to do now is make a couple dozen of these for each eight foot section Well, nothing could be easier than putting this fence section together. I've laid the rails on the floor and fastened three pails in place. Now I'm just checking for squareness, and that's good. Now each pail sticks above the top stringer seven inches, and this stringer will be in a flat position when it's stood up. The bottom of the pail sticks below the lower stringer four and a quarter inches. And that stringer is in a vertical position when it's stood up. Now each of the pails is fastened in place with some six-penny galvanized common nails, five inches on center. Well, that's all there is to making this particular style of fence. Now, this next fence style that I want to show you how to build has a nice diamond shape to the top of the picket or the pail. And down at the bottom, it has a six-inch board which will run from post to post. Now, I'm certain that the tops of these were all cut one at a time by hand back in Williamsburg but I want to speed things up a bit. So I'm going to gang several pickets together, nine in this case, and cut them with my radial arm that I've tipped to 50 degrees. And the first cut I'm going to make is along this line, which will start to form the bottom of the diamond. Now, with the blade still at 50 degrees, I'm just going to lower the saw a bit to start to form the top edge of each diamond.
Now to get a nice sharp corner at this intersection, I'm gonna use a back saw and just make a cut at each angle. To give me that nice sharp point. Just as before, I've laid out the stringers, fastened on three of the pickets, or pails, and now I'm checking it for square, and that's good. Now, this fence also has a skirt along the bottom. To make sure that the pickets will fit tightly to it, I've put on three temporary cleats, and now I'm going to fasten the skirt board right in place and then finish installing the pickets. Now these pickets are installed four and three quarter inches center to center. Okay, well that takes care of the diamond top fence. Now we'll turn our attention to the simplest of all the fence designs. This fence just has rough boards of random width nailed to rough stringers. The only decoration is this cutout at the top, which is done after the boards have been nailed to the string. Well, just as with the other fence sections, I've set down the stringers and attached a couple pails at each end, and now I'm again checking it for square, and that's okay. Now, the spacing of the stringers is about 19 inches down from the top of the fence. You have to remember, I'm going to be cutting those V's in there, so in some places, they'll only be about 10 inches above this stringer. One stringer placed in between the two, and then the bottom stringer is about four inches up to the bottom edge of it. I've also installed this string from the first pail to the last pail as a guide for my boards as I nail them in place. Over here, you see a whole bunch of boards of different widths, five inches, six, about seven and a half, and some that are about three and a half. I'm not really going to pay much attention to what order I choose them in. I'm just going to set them down and then space them out with these scraps of wood that are about five-eighths of an inch and nail them in place. Okay, well that's all the pails that I'm going to put on this section. Now I'll lay out for the cut at the top. Now the new section that I'm making is going to be attached to this end of my prototype. And in order to make all the peaks and valleys line up, I need to take this last board, bring it over to the section I'm working on now, and just tack it in place. There's one nail in the center. We'll do it. Okay, now up at the top here, you'll notice that I've snapped two lines, one that's six feet from the bottom of the fence for the peaks, and one eight and a half inches down for the valleys. Now the valleys will be located along that bottom line, 12 inches on center from the one that I've already cut. And I'll do that all the way down the line. The peak is halfway between, or six inches. And I'll just use a framing square to transfer that mark up to the top chalk line, and then go 12 inches on center along that line. Once I connect all the points together, I'll be ready to cut it out. just about does it for today. Tomorrow, we'll install these two sections and build a gate for it.
Well, let's see if we can get one of these sections to fit in. I tell you, they're heavy. They're not easy to horse around all alone. Yeah, that's not bad. Now you can see that I'm setting the sections in some five by five posts that started out being eight feet long. There's a good three feet down below grade. Now don't make the mistake of surrounding them with concrete. Just use some good gravel so that it'll drain. Now, I also took the post and made notches for each one of the stringers, and I cut those on the radial arm saw with the Beto head cutter. Now we're gonna put a gate here. It's gonna close up against the stop block on the corner of the building and swing out this way. And earlier this morning, I mortised and tenoned all the parts. Let's go put it together. The frame for the gate is made from rough cut two by fours. And the two vertical members have three mortises in them that I cut using the mortising machine that I used earlier to cut the through mortises on the picket fence. Now the cross pieces have tenons on each end and those were cut with the radial arm saw with the stacked dado head cutter. Now to add strength to the joints, I've applied a one part waterproof glue to both surfaces, something new that I'm giving a try. I'm just using a couple screws at each joint to act as pins. Perhaps the most important piece of the gate is this diagonal cross piece. I've half lapped it in the center and I've cut the corners to fit snugly at the intersection of the style and the rail. This is going to keep the gate from racking. You know, I really like the way the cutouts on the top of this fence look when it's all installed. And when I get around to it, I'll put on a coat of stain. I think this is going to become a nice backdrop for the new Yankee workshop. So whether you choose to build that fence or one of these colonial versions, I'm sure it'll add a lot to your property.